It looks like new physics is on the horizon. Fermilab has unveiled the results of their Muon G2 experiment, which shows a deviation from what's predicted by the standard model of particle physics. This is a major deal because the standard model of particle physics is one of the greatest achievements we have in science. It's been built up over decades to try and understand how the particles in the subatomic world interact with each other to make the world we see around us, and it does an incredibly good job at doing that. And in fact, the difference between what has been observed and what the standard model predicts is incredibly small. It is 0.0000002 different. That incredibly small number is the difference between what the standard model predicts and what has been observed. But even that small number is enough to suggest that we don't understand what's going on. And this is exciting because it means that there's probably new forces or particles interacting in the universe that we don't have included in the standard model of particle physics. So this is why many physicists are getting excited and thinking that we may soon be discovering some new fundamental physics. And that doesn't happen too often these days. So let's go into the experiment and try and understand what it's all about and what the experiment might actually mean. So this experiment revolved around the subatomic particle called a muon. Now a muon is pretty much just a very heavy electron. It weighs about 200 times the mass of an electron and it's unstable, meaning that it has a finite lifetime. A muon only lives for about two millionths of a second. So doing any experiments with a muon is pretty challenging. So that in itself is a pretty remarkable achievement. But just making muons and looking at them isn't what this experiment did. This experiment looked at how the muons interacted with a magnetic field. Like many particles, muons have properties known as a spin and they have an electric charge. These two things come together to make the muon behave as kind of like a gyroscope inside of a magnetic field. If the muon is a little bit offset from the magnetic field, it'll process around the magnetic field lines. And this precession is what they investigated with the experiment at Fermilab. So this experiment boils down to asking the question of how does a muon interact with the magnetic field? And we can try and understand how a muon would interact with the magnetic field through our theoretical models. And we'll be looking at some things called Feynman diagrams here, which will help us perhaps put into a little perspective how these interactions take place. In these diagrams, the muon will be represented as straight lines, and they'll have a little Greek letter mu sitting next to them. And the other important thing is this squiggly line here. This is what we call a photon, or in this case, it's a virtual photon from the magnetic field that interacts with the muon. Now this interaction is just the universe telling the muon that there is a magnetic field there, so that is the interaction taking place. So this very simple Feynman diagram where a muon travels in this direction, interacts with a virtual photon from the magnetic field, and then travels in that direction, is the simplest way a muon can interact with a magnetic field. And if you do the math on this, it gives you a number equal to 2, and this 2 is pretty important for understanding how a muon processes in a magnetic field. Now naively, you would think this is all that could happen with a muon interacting with a magnetic field. It just interacts with it, and that's that. But of course, quantum mechanics is never that simple. And this idea that Dirac came up with was superseded later on by Julian Schwinger, who came up with this idea that a muon could be traveling along and it could emit a virtual photon and then interact with the virtual photon from the magnetic field, and then as it's traveling on after interacting with the magnetic field, reabsorb the virtual photon it emitted beforehand. Now this is a little bit complicated, but it's entirely allowed to do this. If it emits a virtual photon, there's a certain time frame that that photon's allowed to exist for, and it can interact with the thing it emitted, so it's all fine and good. But this adds an extra complication to the value that controls how the muon processes in a magnetic field. Now this extra complication, if you do the math, comes out to be around 1 divided by 
2 pi times 137. This might seem like a pretty small number, but it's actually pretty important. If you don't account for this, then your expectations of what should happen will end up being wrong. But this isn't the end of the complications that take place. It gets even more complicated. There's a way in which the muon can interact with the magnetic field through the weak force, where instead of emitting a virtual photon before interacting with the magnetic field, it emits a Z boson, the force carrier for the weak nuclear force. And this again alters the value which Dirac first calculated. In this case, the alteration is only of the order of 10 to the minus 9. So it's a very small alteration, but it's still a difference. So what are the other ways that we know of that a muon can interact with the magnetic field? Well, it gets even more complicated if we think about some other particles. If we go back to the situation where a muon emits a virtual photon before interacting with the magnetic field, that virtual photon can create a quark and antiquark. And those two subatomic fundamental particles can then go forth and become what we call hadronized and make a whole zoo of particles that can interact with each other before eventually reforming the same virtual photon. That then goes on to be captured again by the muon. Now all of these complicated interactions we represent with the circle here in the middle of the Feynman diagram. And if you go through and do all of the very complicated math behind this, you'll find that this thing that we call the vacuum polarization has an effect by about an order of 10 to the power of minus 8. So 8 zeros before the actual number. Again, a really small contribution. But it can get even more complicated. There is a process called light by light interaction where now we'll draw the muon as traveling in a straight line. It emits a virtual photon up and that does its strange process where it makes a quark and antiquark that go forth and interact in a whole mess of stuff. But now the virtual photon from the magnetic field interacts also with that mess. So we draw that virtual photon line coming in to that circle and then leaving that circle before interacting with the muon. So this is an incredibly complicated process. And it's only been relatively recently that theorists have been able to actually quantify what this actually does to the value that Dirac calculated. And its contribution is incredibly small. It's around about 10 to the power of minus 10 to 10 to the power of minus nine in contribution. So these are the ways that we know of that a muon can interact with a magnetic field. And all of this comes together to make a very complicated picture. But clearly, it's not complicated enough. Otherwise, the value that was observed by the muon G2 experiment would have agreed with the value calculated by the standard model of particle physics. So something else is going on there. So with all of the complicated theory out of the way, hopefully things make a little bit of sense. But let's talk now about how they actually did the experiment. What they did was essentially fired a bunch of muons into a big magnetic cylinder. These muons would run around the magnetic cylinder and because they're in a magnetic field, they would process. Now what they actually measured were the decay products of the muon. Way back at the start of the video, I mentioned that muons only live for about two millionths of a second. That's if they're standing still. But these muons are going quite fast, so they last a little bit longer. And these muons end up decaying into what we call a positron or an anti-electron. And these positrons get captured by their detectors in the middle of this big ring or this big racetrack. And based on theory and how they expect the muon to process in a magnetic field as it goes around the big racetrack, they expect a certain kind of energy for the positrons to hit their detectors with. So by looking at the energies that the positrons hit the detectors, they can actually work out if the theory agrees with what they're seeing. And of course, it's incredibly complicated because they're trying to detect variations on a tiny, tiny scale. But they're able to actually go through and identify all of the sources of noise that could be present and do an incredible job at removing them so that they get an incredibly precise measurement. 
And what they find, of course, is that this incredibly precise measurement deviates from what you would expect from the standard model of particle physics. So if this were the only measurement taken, you could perhaps say, maybe it's just some weird experimental error with the setup. But this is actually the second time that this has been observed. The first time it was observed was in 2004, where they did a similar experiment and they found the same result. The difference between the standard model back then and the experimental value, it was a little bit bigger than what they found this time, but they were both consistent with each other, which means that the result from 2004 was actually correct. And the two results now support each other in telling us that the standard model doesn't describe everything that's going on. Now, when we're talking about the theory before, all of those different ways in which a muon could interact with the magnetic field have a degree of probability with them because we're talking about quantum mechanics. And as we get to more and more complicated models, the probability that that interaction would happen becomes smaller and smaller. And as such, the contribution to the value that controls how the muon processes decreases. So the fact that they've measured a difference on the order of 2 times 10 to the minus 9 between theory and observation suggests that there's an incredibly rare process going on that changes how a muon interacts with the magnetic field. What causes that change? What might be controlling this interaction? What strange Feynman diagrams we could draw up for these interactions? No one knows at this point. It's a massive question in physics. There are ideas that extend the standard model of particle physics with something called supersymmetry, where every particle has a supersymmetric partner particle, which might be able to explain this deviation. But then there are also other things in the universe that we know should exist, but we have no explanation for in quantum physics. Like in astronomy, we see lots of peculiar behavior that we can attribute to things like dark matter, which we think are subatomic particles that are in an enormous quantity surrounding galaxies and galaxy clusters that provides the gravitational pull necessary to hold everything together. Or maybe even it could relate to dark energy. We still don't understand how the universe is expanding faster and faster. So there are these big questions in astrophysics that need particle physics solutions that we just don't have at the moment. So I'm kind of hoping that it might be something related to what we call the dark universe, either dark energy or dark matter. But of course, that's just speculation and um, hopeful guessing at the moment. But for now, all we can do is just kind of wait for the theorists and the experimentalists to keep doing their work and try and understand what it might be. I'm really excited to see what this could be. I mean, it's not too often that we say there might be new physics, new fundamental physics that's being uncovered in the universe. So what do you think could cause this incredibly small difference of 0.0000002 between the observed value and the theoretical value? Maybe you're like me and hope that it's something to do with dark energy or dark matter. Or maybe you are a supporter of the supersymmetric model of particle physics. Or maybe it's just something else entirely that no one's thought of yet. That perhaps could be the most exciting. But if you're interested in this topic, I do recommend checking out the public lecture they gave on this result. It was very interesting and very informative and most of this video was based on that lecture. I've left a link to that lecture in the description. But for now, thanks for watching and I hope you're like me and excited to see newer physics enter the world.